So uh, then we'll have this recorded so that we can send it up to YouTube in case people miss it and, and check it. All right? Any questions so far? No? No questions from Slack? I'm on the wrong channel. Let me go back. Okay. Yeah, the Google Doc is at uh, bit.ly uh, 6101 dash lack choice. So someone else can put that in there. That's fine. Okay. We're all good, right? All right, so hopefully you guys have followed through um, in the last two weeks and gone through the introduction to NLP and deep learning, and uh, you understand a bit about word vectors. <coughs> Did anyone not do that yet? It's okay to confess. Everyone did do it. Okay, a couple people didn't. Okay. So do we got do we want collectively to go over word vectors or everyone okay with that? If we're okay with that, then it might actually be good as a, a, a ground break uh, icebreaker. You want to spend um, 20 minutes going through word vectors? Shall we do that? Okay. Okay, so um, again, NLP is really concerned with the meaning of words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, and documents, right? And for a very long time, people didn't have a very good uh, way of representing all of this, what we call semantics, the meaning of words, okay? We knew from a very long time, uh, from the 1950s, that first, one of the philosophers and uh, scholars in linguistics said that you know uh, the meaning of the words by the company it keeps, right? So even if you have a dictionary definition, that doesn't really reflect how people learn about meaning. We don't look up words and memorize them and then commit that to memory and then understand the, the meaning of there. We look at the context, right? You think about children and toddlers, we learn from context, right? And for a long time, what people did was they represented words as single tokens. You know, so if I see a word, word, right, I take that as a specific token, and I can represent that as a vocabulary, uh, meaning all of the different words in the English language would be the vocabulary. So you can think about how large that vocabulary size would be, maybe about 30,000 words in the normal English dictionary, okay? So if you think of a vector representation for that, you'd say each um, word is one dimension in this 30,000 dimensional space, right? And so a document or a sentence could just have a, be a binary vector or um, a real number vector where each dimension would have a non-zero value if I see a integer uh, non-zero at that point, okay? So, uh, what are some potential problems with that representation? Can you guys tell me? You will lose the context for that. So, if you know that you have a not, so let me just repeat what Tui said. He said, what happens if you have a negation somewhere in your sentence? You have a not. Okay. When you use this type of bag of words representation, we'll lose the fact uh, where the not occurred, right? right? Which word was uh, uh, succeeding the not, right? So that's one big problem, right? It actually, this continues to be a problem with word vector representation is we lose word order, right? So if you uh, remember throughout the presentation about continuous bag of words and skip n-grams, skip grams, right? We don't have record, we don't record positional information very much, right? So what's the problem with this? What we call one-hot representation, aside from what Zui said. Sir, your name? 
Chen Yang. Okay. Oh. Exactly. So the problem with this one hot representation is it's a very, very high dimensional, right? For every English word, okay, let's say we lemmatize it, we keep it in the standard form, right? We take off all the S's for plurals, we take off all the ten marks, ED's, and S's at the end for verbs. We still end up with a very, very large dimensional space, maybe 30,000. How large is the normal word embedding vector size that you guys see? Can you guys call out numbers? What do you hear? 50, a couple hundred, 100, 300, okay. So that space that we are now working with in um, state-of-the-art NLP is a much, much smaller representation, right? Only maybe at most three to 500 dimensions. What happened? How did we take this 30,000 dimensional space and smoosh it down to something that's only 300 large? How did we do that? Come on, you all go to the lecture in the middle, right? A sploit called currency. How how do you do that, sir? You mean? How can you? Sorry about that. The idea is to look at co-occurrences, not to find a word by its a, a presence or not, but by the window of other words nearby. Right? So if you look through a continuous bag of words and skip uh, skip grams, it's almost the same concept. You define what a word is by its surrounding n plus two words on the left and surrounding n plus two words on the right, or a varying size window. Right? So the idea is if you have something like doctor, it's going to co-occur with words like nurse, hospital, patient, illness, surgery, okay? And if you look at nurse, maybe many of the same words will be there, okay? So we know somehow that nurse and doctor are related, right? Because of their distributional semantics. That means the same type of words tend to co-occur with nurse and doctor, right? So we're going to use that information, that contextual information, to define the word rather than use a dictionary definition. Okay? So that helps in a lot of other ways too. Okay? Because we do that, we can distinguish words that have different meanings but the same written form. Those are called what? Homographs, right? Meaning they have the same graphical form on the graph, right? So the word bank, for example, famous NLP word that we use a lot of time, for example, right? The word financial bank, the word river bank, the two English words that are spelled the exact same way, but have really two different meanings, right? But we know these two different meanings co-occur with a completely different set of words, right? Stock market, prices, falls, rises, versus fishing, River, tides, sea, ocean, okay, different words. So by these, by virtue of this type of co-occurrence, we can distinguish bank as in river bank or bank as in uh, financial bank from each other. Okay, so um, this is uh, what we can think about when we go to uh, use a distribution, right? So here's the one that um, we should put up, right? So a word vector is basically a fairly modern solution to this, invented about uh, less than 10 years ago, which is to build a dense vector instead of having 30,000 dimensions, put it down to 50 to 300 dimensions for this type of context, okay? So um, just to be clear about it, Embeddings and vectors are the same thing. Okay? 
So everyone familiar with word to vec shall we go through this very quickly? Who can describe what happens in word to vec for us, since you guys have all taken the lecture for, me, for us? Anyone want to give it a shot? Come on, this is the study group. It's not mentioned in the lecture. I don't think it's mentioned. Anyone can describe? What? What? Can you describe what the word to vec algorithm does? Mm -hmm. So the objective is to be able to use the top product of the input layer and first the output layer and then in this case we are going to use the in-brand algorithm the input vector with the vector word to do a top product with Okay, I don't think everyone heard that, but did you guys get the gist of that? Okay, so we're taking these one hot vectors, which are a very large space of 30,000 dimensions, and we're trying to squish it down using a neural network, right, uh, into a d dimensional neural network through a hidden layer of size d, and then output to a vector which is of also size d. Is that correct? To a vocabulary size. Uh, so here's basically the idea that uh, I forgot your name again. Al Gang, okay, said uh, we're going to do right. So we have a center word that we're trying to represent, okay, into for example, and we know the probabilities from a large set of documents or a corpus. What are the probabilities of words at a certain distance, right? The probability uh, that banking occurs next after into 
or crises occurs two positions away, right? Given that that word occurs, okay? So I'm going to use uh, compute all these probabilities over the entire corpus, and I'm going to do this for a sliding window, okay? So um, you know, if I go to the word banking, I have a different word at the center. I'm looking for words uh, two before and two after, also calculating their probabilities, okay? And as Haogang said, then we are going to try to train a neural network to output a smaller representation aside from this larger one, right? So we have an objective function that we have to try to maximize, okay, or uh, uh, minimize because we, we want it to cost less. I mean, in machine learning, typically we think of it as a cost function or an error measure, okay? So we want to minimize the cost, so we want um, this uh, type of probability to be output, right? So in word to vec we want to be able to predict the context words, okay? Predict the context words within a window of fixed size M, given that I have a center word, right? So I know the center word. Can I predict the other words that are nearby, right? Minus or plus, okay? And then you can think of the opposite problem, which is I know the context. Help me predict what the center word is, right? That's the the flip measure of that. Okay? So, uh, we have to calculate this probability, right? How to calculate uh, WT plus J, given the fact that I know WT and I know the parameters of my network, right? My parameters are usually called theta or W, depending on uh, which version of math you subscribe to. Okay? So here we're using W to mean word, so it's not the weight. Okay, let's just, just be clear about that. Okay? So we're going to be using two types of vectors. We're going to be using a vector for the center word, the one that we were representing, as well as a vector for the word W, which is our context, right? And then we have a probability that we can calculate given that, um, and try to normalize it given the partition function that we have here. Okay, so we're just making sure we sum over all the words that appear so that we can get a probability value that everything sums to unity. Okay, everyone get it so far? Any questions? If you have a question, don't get lost, okay? Please let us know, and then we'll ask our peers to help clear things up. Okay, word vectors are incredibly powerful. You could do a, a project just on word vectors alone. There's plenty of research within the last, uh, you know, half a year, three years, that's just on word vectors. I came back from a housing class week. Uh, at least a third of the papers are about uh, representation of some sort using vectors. Any questions so far? So like Hao Yang said, uh, we are trying to uh, ha choose an objective function that gets two things, right? We want our positive example, meaning words that actually occur in the same neighborhood, to be close to each other. Their values have to be close to each other in this vector representation. And we want words that are not similar, okay, that are not in the same uh, type of distributional context. So a word like apple compared to nurse and doctor could be pretty different, okay? Then we want to pick these negative examples to be far away from this, okay? So we're going to use the neural network to engineer our word vectors. Everyone with us so far? Okay, so we did through this. Okay, then we need to do the prediction how Liang already stepped through what happens at the softmax, right? So in the softmax, what we want to do is, given the center word over here, predict the actual outcome, right? The similarity between a word and a center word. Okay, so we're going to go through the other direction uh, to map all of the observations into a probability value, and then pick the one that's the maximum of this. Right? Okay. So you see the softmax used a lot. Uh, it's just a, a function that allows us to de describe a, a probability value over many, many classes. Right? Okay. So some of the big problems we have in this, uh, there are a couple big problems, right? Is, is how to get the gradients over all the vectors. So 
what's happening uh, here? Can anyone help us out? Right? So what's this theta? Theta is the weight vector for all of the model parameters, right? It encompasses all of the different model parameters for the entire neural network, right? At a, at a particular layer, for example. Okay? So how many components do we have in this theta? Sir, your name? Okay. Everyone clear about that? So you get two sets of vectors, uh, sorry, two sets of weights, one for each type of vector as a center word or as an uh, outside word, right? And it depends on the size of the vocabulary, right? So this is actually a very long list, right? From hard mark all the way to zebra, we'll have uh, parameters for this, right? So one is the B uh, vector, which I think here is uh, for which one? Is this the inside, the center word? Right, and the U is for the outside word, right? So if you have a 30,000 uh, vocabulary side, that means you have 60,000 parameters that you need to So we then need to optimize all of these parameters to get out our word representation. Okay? So uh, you need to know uh, your college uh, calculus to do this, right? So you have to use the chain rule to derive uh, the equation for how to do the updating. So we're not going to go over this at this point in time right now. Okay. So uh, hopefully you remember this. When you're back doing back propagation, you have to go through all the steps for this. So uh, we'll we'll try to step through that a little bit uh, later today when we go through lecture four. Okay. So I'm not going to go over all this math. Hopefully you guys have gone through this. Everyone okay with this so far? Okay. Yes. If you haven't gone through it, please let us know on the Slack. Okay. And then hopefully another kind soul in this class will also help out. Okay. okay. Uh, I think everyone is familiar with gradient descent, but just in case uh, you're not, uh, basically we have a, a particular cost function which we uh, showed you earlier, right? Um, this cost function here, okay, which we're trying to uh, minimize. And because we have uh, usually choose a loss function that's convex, right, meaning it has a single uh, minimum, we can try to um, use just gradients to, to find the right uh, minimum for that, right? So that's uh, envisioned by this plot here, right? So we might start off with one particular set of parameters, theta. Okay, this is in, in just a 1D setting here. So let's pretend we only have uh, a single univariate calculation. Right? And so we might have initialized it to some random value here. Okay? And then after we calculate the gradient, we'll know the slope of the gradient at this position. And then we can take a learning step. We can optimize the parameters to better fit um, our objective function of keeping things close by, near to each other in the vector space, and things, negative examples, which are not supposed to be close to each other, far away. Right? So we're going to iterate this, but this is just a univariate case. We're going to be doing this, obviously, for the multivariate case where we have uh, all um, two, to the uh, two times the vocabulary size for that. Okay. So unfortunately, as you know, um, our objective function is, where did that come from? Okay. is uh, not convex. So we will have to do more uh, complicated things to deal with this. Okay, so if it's a two-dimensional bowl, then you would have a convex space like that. Okay, so uh, we're going to use gradient descent, which takes a certain step size, looks at the gradient, which is our um, our delta here over the loss function, and compute a step 
uh, to make sure the parameters go in the right direction there. Okay? So it's an iterative algorithm. Where we're just doing multiple runs over to uh, keep minimizing the cost function by taking a step in the direction of the negative of the gradient. So uh, everyone here know about the difference between uh, gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent? Anyone not clear about that? Okay, so we'll skip this. Okay, we're going to skip the problem set, so we're done with lecture two. So there are seats here, you want to take a seat? Okay, then word quote, document quote occurrences uh, can give um, general topics. This is similar to LSA or SVD. When we do SVD on the large matrix, we get some things similar to that. Where we have a, a large document and word quote occurrence, and we try to cut it down into smaller clusters to give uh, uh, you know clusters of terms that mean uh, have similar co occurrences, and then. Um, hint at the topic of uh, different arguments. Okay? So here's a window-based co-occurrence. I, if I take these sentences and I decompose it, I'll get something like this, right? I like deep learning, I like NLP, so like occurs twice uh, in the same sentence as like, right? So I'm going to get a window-based co-occurrence matrix like this. And then, um, of course, it's a very large dimensional space. And so what we want to do is uh, use other methods to compute and, and simplify this co-occurrence. Okay? So we want to reduce the dimensionality of this type of uh, large co-occurrence matrix, right? Because we want to, to know that similar words group together. And so we can use something like uh, singular value decomposition Right, from uh, linear algebra, right? So we have a large matrix X, right? Where here we have a number of documents, maybe M number of terms, N number of documents. And these are the co-occurrences that we saw on the, the or, uh, red matrix there. And we're just going to decompose it into three matrices, U, S, and V, such that we have the singular values here, right? So we have non-zeros all on the Diagonal here, all zeros on the other parts. Okay? And then what we can do is truncate this matrix in some smaller ways um, so that we can get a, a good approximation to x, right? So instead of having all of the dimensions here, uh, instead of using all r dimensions, as you can see, we can shrink it down to a smaller value k. All right, and then try to reproduce the X matrix by multiplying back all of these uh, matrices that have the low rank approximation cut off. Okay, so we can do that using uh, SVD. And then uh, this is standard topic model stuff, so you may have seen some of this before, where we get some type of semantic uh, patterns from this. So if we look at... Uh, different words that are close together in this SVD matrix decomposition, you'll find uh, certain parts of the body tend to co-occur together. Certain uh, nouns of animals tend to co-occur together. And country names also co-occur in, in parts of that space. So this is Hannah Rohde's work. She just gave a keynote at the same conference that I presented my keynote uh, last week. So um, yeah, I'm not going to go through that. So we have two different uh, modes of doing this type of uh, distributional semantics. What we just covered in the last three minutes or so is what was done about two decades ago, right? Which is uh, to do some method of using LSA or some hierarchical agglomerative learning algorithm or a principal component analysis, which is to do that type of composition, right? Okay, but what we're going through is 
on the right side more from this class is the vector representation of learning, right? Which we use uh, tick grams or continuous kind of words from words events or other things like that from love to be able to generate um, the same similar types of semantics. Okay. So Stanford then came up with a system that's supposed to combine both of these algorithms in some way together. It's called GLOVE, okay? And the idea behind this is, uh, you know, just changing the loss function a little bit, okay? So uh, can you guys help describe what's going on in this part here? Okay, so this term here, this multiplication between U and V are the two vectors that we've already talked about, right? The Avinav and... Um, Program okay. What what else is going on in this? So what's changed in the loss function? Why does that help? Can anyone else tell me uh, why? To, to add on to what Oriana said, why does um, subtracting the second term help you accomplish the goal of uh, the Merkel says it's an L2 distance between the similarity of V and U vector and uh, let me see what I can and their log, log likelihood. Okay? Everyone agree with that? You need to be able to be able <laughs> to produce this explanation on your own as well. Okay? So what do we do with these two sets of vectors, right? Do you want to capture their similarity uh, from the co-occurrence information, okay? And then uh, pull together uh, these vectors in a final matrix, right? So we have all of the V vectors and the U vectors uh, together in a matrix, and then we're going to uh, sum them together to create a, a final matrix, X final. So uh, please go look through the glove paper and uh, try to understand this a bit more. Okay. So I, I don't think you need to look at the actual evaluation results. Uh, I think you've seen some of these before. So some words that are close to frog are, are some of the names of frogs, etc. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether it's accessible for mobile. Uh, hopefully somebody on Slack can answer that. Okay. How do we evaluate word vectors? Right? We want uh, to be able to look at two different ways of evaluating. One is intrinsic. So intrinsic means looking at the word vectors themselves and trying to understand whether they represent something useful. Extrinsic means uh, using an evaluation that's on a task. Right? So we look at some task-based way of deciding whether um, the word vectors are creating meaning to help us solve a problem. Okay. So intrinsic word vector evaluation means you just look at the word vectors themselves, right? So we can do analogies, right? So if I give you two words and I say, what is it analogous to you know, on another one? Uh, then maybe I can check whether the results are good, right? So I can do this uh, by just computing uh, an operation between a word vector that I'm trying to look at, xi, and evaluating which xi is the closest word that fits this, uh, this uh, association, right? So I'm looking for the xi that maximizes 
this expression, okay? And so I want to find out, you know, given that I start with men and then I have um, a vector for women, I'm going to take a look at the difference between these two, okay? So there's a, a vector difference going from man to women, and then I'm going to apply that same vector difference to another starting word, like king, right? So I'm going to go the same distance in, let's say, this two-dimensional space, and I'm going to find out what word lies at the closest point to that, right? And so you can see some of these visualizations, I'm sure many of you have seen them before, to show that these types of relationships do tend to hold when you train a word vector representation. Um, so there's ones uh, for kinship, like this one. There's one for companies, right? Uh, one for superlatives and uh, relatives and other, other fun things that I'm sure you've seen before. So you can do vector addition and subtraction to get uh, good um, guesses about where things are supposed to be. Okay, so these are all different types of intrinsic evaluation of word vectors to just see whether you can manipulate uh, words that have some semantic uh, relationship. Use that relationship as a vector difference Apply that vector difference to another set of words, either to words or nouns, okay, or adjectives and adverbs, and see whether you can come up with uh, good uh, question, uh, answers for that. Okay. Now, question: Can we use these types of intrinsic word vector evaluations to then help us train the word to back or glove process? Can we involve it in the training process as well? What do you guys think? Right. So if I have pairs of these analogies, and I know I have correct answers for them, I can surely involve them in the training process too, right? I can put it as another term in the lock function if I have enough of these to, to act again, right? So as long as I have some constraints on the on what I want for the output, I could involve it in the lock function. Okay. So you can use a, a lot of these constraints either for evaluation because you want to check whether your word vectors are output in such a way that uh, it seems to conform to your understanding. Or you can involve them directly in training the uh, data set. Right? You can say, I want to make sure that when I train my algorithm, uh, train my word vectors, I want it to have these particular properties encoded. Okay? So you can think about how, how you would do that. Okay. So there are lots of different types of constraints or analogies that you, you can think of. You know, some of them are what are gone in, in the slides like superlatives, relatives, or adjectives. But even, you know, named entity types have certain relations. So on this slide you see city within state, right? So we would want that type of uh, relationship to hold even when I produce word vectors to make it a constraint when I produce the word vectors rather than using it necessarily as an evaluation function. Okay. So um, they go through a lot of uh, different problems with this because you're basically assembling these uh, types of relationships from a corpus. And that corpus, if you're taking it from common call or a very large corpora, it will display all the particularities of that corpus. Okay. So uh, that can be a problem, especially uh, you know when when I talk about NLP in production in the real world. Sometimes, uh, you know, commercial companies would just go and use word to vector blood, not realizing that they've been built on particular corpora. And these corpora have particular um, peculiarities in their bias, okay? Because of the way the, uh, the corpus is assembled, it reflects the word associations that are very common on the web, which is not necessarily the word associations that we want to encode the, ourselves. 
So one very uh, simple example here is that, you know, country names, uh, capital names, they can all change over time, okay? So if you use this type of relationship and you're going to test it later on, you're going to find that actually your, the country names and uh, capital names may change. It may reflect uh, older names, for example, or outdated names, right? But there's a, a problem in other cases where uh, you've seen in AI in general that uh, you know, uh, particular systems, for example, vision systems, they can end up biased, right? They, they may be able to detect people with light colored skin, but dark colored skin they cannot detect just because the training data doesn't have that information inside. So word to vec is one of these systems that people use and love all the time because the semantics are much better than the, pre, uh, the previous generation of semantics. But because it's based on a corpus and that corpus has certain biases, you are going to be building knowingly or unknowingly some biases in, okay? So for example, uh, the corpus that, that's out there for word to vec and Glove, they're based on Wikipedia and the web. It doesn't represent Asian names very well, okay? So if you're going to build some name entity system for Asian names and build it on word to vec you might be stuck trying to sec uh, sell it to a vendor here. You could probably get away with selling it to a vendor in California, okay? Because California names are, are quite representative of what's on the web, at least the crawl that they created, right? If you get a crawl of the web from Baidu, another company, then of course it's going to look very different. Okay? So I think enough about that. Let's go to um, lecture four. Okay, it's pretty hot in here. Shall we take a, a five minute break? Yeah? And let the room cool down for a little bit? Okay, I'm sorry there's not enough space here. I'll try to get a big lecture hall for next week. Um, but if you are feeling, tell us how you feel about the class. If, if you think things are going too fast, too slow, you've done enough homework, and you think this is not uh, at the relevant pace, we'd like to pitch it at a pace that's uh, useful to most people in the class. There'll be some people who don't have enough background, this will be way over your head. There'll be some people who have a lot of background, this will be uh, too easy for you. Uh, so it's meant to be an introductory class, okay, at the graduate level. So I hope that helps, okay? So we'll break for five minutes. Uh, we'll come back at 7.07 .07 by the back clock. And then we'll start uh, lecture four. Okay? So please take a short break. No, it's video. So these these people here are all remote. They're watching this class from the Google Hangouts. Yes, we will uh, record most of it and then 
and then we'll put it up on YouTube and you can watch it on YouTube. But it's obviously better to watch it while the class is being presented and uh, with the other peers so that you can talk. Okay. Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're, I didn't real. You know, the first class we never know how many people will show up, so we, we don't know what to predict. This is the largest easy lecture we've ever done. Sorry? End of this lesson? So I've already gone through the logistics already. Did you catch that part in the beginning? Okay. No, the logistics for the class. Yeah, so how this class is run. So I don't have time to go over it right now, but if you want to stay after class, I can go over it again. Uh, I think we missed part of it, but um, it was on the, the website earlier. I'll just tell you um, what I told the other students earlier. So the, the obligations for this class is that everyone in the class has to help to present the lecture and to ask questions of the lecture. Okay, so there's uh, this spreadsheet that you need to go to that's on the Slack, um, which is written up there that you need to put uh, your preference for which lecture you're going to take and which lecture you're going to ask questions on. Okay? Yeah. And then when you do that, um, I will be the one arbitrating which class you get because we can't have everyone presenting in one week. We have to have it all spread out for all ten weeks. Okay? And there's another obligation for this class is that uh, you will also have to do uh, a, a project. The project has to use deep learning in some fashion for natural language processing. And then it must be something that you can publicly showcase. Because some people in our class are from outside, like yourself, I think. You might be from a company, you might want to use NLP on your own data sets. That's fine, but as long as you can make a poster presentation at a high level, what network architecture you use, why you use it, etc. And we will archive that as part of um, SOC's output. So we have a project showcase. They have it in June 13th, which I think this data set is November 14th this year on Wednesday, that uh, you will need to come back at, uh, from 6 to 9 o'clock to present your poster along with everyone else in the class. So those are two obligations. This is a 10 week course. So it's a normal semester long course. But it's driven by all the people in this room. It's not driven by me. It's just the logistics uh, that I presented at the beginning of class and then a couple of introductions uh, about the first four lectures that we did. You have to do some searching. There are lecture slides available for Richard, but you need to make sense of them. He has also a video screen uh, of a previous lecture, so they recorded them to YouTube. So my suggestion is to watch those lectures. Uh, they're not always factually accurate, so some of the math is wrong. So when you uh, get puzzled, then ask the other members of your team, okay, does this one look right? And then you need to make your own presentation um, using or not using this slide is up to you. And because, uh, because we have so many people, likely there will be five or six people assigned to each lecture group. You need to meet physically um, to coordinate the lecture duties. So usually somebody will take the first 15 minutes, then the next person the next 15 minutes, etc. Who is responsible for a certain subsection of one lecture that you have to watch. Group um, project. It's uh, we haven't defined yet because this is the first day of class. Um, likely, given the class size, we'll ask people to work in teams of three or greater. Okay. So, but if you have constraints, like there's only two people from your company and you just want to work together, that's fine. Yes, you can take this C2, I won't be using it either. Yeah. <laughs>
you have a question? I'm going back to NLP because NLP is my research area. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And so for the next book, I will be with you. Okay. Okay, so I don't know whether we're going to get through all of these slides, but we'll, we'll try to get through some of it at least, okay? So, um, you know, I think every week, uh, just to be clear about it, those of us who are going to, every one of us who are going to be doing the lecture, what I'd like you to do is um, within the first couple of days of the lecture, so for example, now it's week three, uh, so after you put in all of your, uh, let me get this fixed up. Yeah. Okay. So after we have all of you expressing your lecture interest, I will try to assign you as fast as possible within the next two days which lecture you're responsible for. Okay. Then what I'll do is on the Slack channel, I'll just advertise to everyone, okay, your lecture preferences uh, have been noted and I've assigned you to a certain lecture. Please go ahead and sign up for the week X prep channels that you're supposed to be uh, taking care of. Okay, and then I hope uh, all of you will work together in that channel to coordinate the presentation. Okay, so for example, week four next week, uh, we'll need a set of questioners, we'll need a set of presenters, and uh, what I typically find works well is that the presenters get together uh, with the questioners and they produce a new set of slides. You know, there's the ones from Richard's class, which unfortunately are not always accurate, so uh, you may find uh, better materials uh, that help to introduce it, uh, the concepts better, and then put them in your, your deck, present them from Google Slides, and then on the Slack channel, also try to seed questions. You find good papers from Archive, or from ACL, or uh, EMNLP, or any of the other NLP conferences that you think are, are interesting to read, uh, put them on the Slack channel too, because uh, this is a good way for everyone to know what's intermediate, what's advanced, and what's beginner. Okay? So that's the best way to get something out of this class. Okay. So, um, you know, when, when we think about classification, that's one very important task that we, we do. So uh, what we want to do is cover that a little bit uh, today. So I think everyone is familiar with general supervised machine learning, uh, right? So the idea is that um, you have a large training set of examples uh, as a row, uh, each as a row, and a, a, an answer, a YI, a, a basic uh, label for that class uh, that you want to predict. So um, that's what we're trying to do. So here's a uh, example of that. So you can uh, go to uh, the ConfNet uh, JS that uh, Andre Karpathy has created to see this in action. So uh, we're going to uh, assume that we have a fixed observation Xi, and we're trying to learn the probability of a certain class, 
And to do that, we're going to train a logistic uh, regression classifier because it not only gives us the classification, it gives us the confidence value, right? Because uh, logistic regression, get a probability of event rather than just the classification, right? Okay? And so for each x, we're trying to predict a, uh, the class yi for this, right? What is the, uh, the correct y classification given our input x? Our input x, as we saw earlier, are some type of inputs. They could be words, uh, for example, the vectors, or uh, a sentence, or a vector that represents a sentence, or a document that represents a document. So we're here, uh, we're going to say that those vectors have dimension d. Right? So our goal is to predict this uh, probability, and this is just going to be uh, this uh, logistic uh, normalization, right, where we're taking all of the outputs from the classifiers, okay, and then normalizing it to a unity value, right? So this is a normalizing constant over here, which says uh, take the um, prediction result for each class, add them all together, and then divide through so that I can have a probability value for each class. Okay, so we can tease apart the prediction function in two steps, right? So we're taking the yf row of w, which is our, our, our matrix, and then multiplying that row with x, right? And this is going to be what we call the signal, right? It's just the, the, product, the sum of the products of each of the weights versus each of the components of x, right? And that's going to get us our, uh, our, our yf. Uh, sorry, our FY, the output of the, our classifier on that particular example, right? I'm going to compute this for all of the classes and then normalize, right? So apply the softmax function to get a normalized probability, right? This is exactly the same as that. Okay? Everyone okay with that? Okay. So what we want to do is, um, you know, maximize the probability of the correct class, right? So these are training samples. We have the associated Y. So we want to make sure that uh, we set our W's in such a way, our, our thetas, if, if you're going in, in the other terminology, so that we can maximize the, uh, the correct probability. So to do that, we're going to minimize the neg negative log probability of that class, right? We want this to uh, be uh, as large as possible. Sorry, as small as possible. Okay. So somebody can answer on Slack uh, that question that um, Mirko asked. So why are we using cross entropy as an error rather than some other type of error? The question to all of you. Uh, we, we have many, many different types of cost functions, right? Cost, cost functions. But why is, for classification, cost entropy the appropriate type of cost function? Couldn't we use squared error? Can we use squared error? We can't. Why? Because we're doing classification, right? Classification means I'm going to do one out of x. Right? There's no distance value to think about when we think about 1 out of 10. Right? So why, why are we using cost entropy? So what does it say here? We have a ground truth value. Uh, which has a 1 at the right class, so this particular class here is the correct class, and everywhere else is 0, so we want to push our cross entropy to reflect that. All right, so we want our cross entropy to look like this, uh, such that uh, just for this one hot class, uh, we get a high probability, zeros everywhere else. Okay? So we can compute cross entropy using KL divergence, right? So we, we can do it like this, right? We have a term, uh, KL divergence is asymmetric, okay? And then 
minimize uh, this is equal to minimizing the KL divergence between uh, two probability distributions, P and Q. Okay? So um, you're going to compute this as the term uh, for substituting in here. So the probability of class C times the log probability of class C over the probability of uh, Q, QC, right? Between the, the distribution for Q and C. Okay? So then we have this part, which is the, the KL divergence, right? Using the cross entropy. And uh, it's going to be a little different than what we had calculated earlier, right? So uh, we can write this on matrix notation if we'd like, but it doesn't really matter here. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So um, have people come across regularization before? Do we need to describe what regularization is? Some people are shaking their head, they don't, they haven't come across it before. Okay, so regularization is a, a really, really, really important machine learning technique, right? It's basically to say that uh, many times when we train an algorithm, it can overfit, can represent the training data too well, all right? And then when you try to apply the classifier to unseen data, because it's per uh, captured all the particularities of the training data, including noise, Okay, that will have some problem classifying the uh, test data. Okay, so let's give an example of that. If I train a uh, face classifier, okay, and you take pictures of my face, okay, and I say this is min, 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 okay. So different poses. Uh, Terrence Sim in our our, our uh, faculty does. Uh, he's called a face guy, so he does a lot of face recognition. So he'll tell you that uh, illumination matters a lot too. So if you're outside or in artificial lighting, the pixel values you get from this will be very different. Okay. So if you train a neural network classifier on faces and you don't know, uh, regularize, what will happen is that it won't be able to figure out another picture of me is also me. Why? Because pictures is captured very specific details about the pixel values at each of the training data, and it can't generalize for that. Okay, so if you have another picture of me but as a slightly different pose in illumination, it won't be able to get that because the parameters have been set in such a way to get all the training data as accurately as possible without trying to generalize. Okay? Everyone understand a little bit about what I mean by overfitting and underfitting now? Okay? So neural networks have this amazing, amazing capacity to overfit. Why? Can anyone tell me? Aside from are the three gentlemen who spoke so far today? Because it's extremely complex, right? I mean, if you think about the number of parameters in neural network system, it's huge. Okay? If you think about simpler things like uh, a simple linear classifier, which is like one neuron, there are only you know, up to that many parameters in, in, in the, the network, right? Because, for example, uh, a single image may have, let's say, a couple thousand pixel values, so you have a couple thousand parameters. Okay? But when you go to a neural network, you typically have several million parameters. Okay? So tuning all of those parameters can give you a very complicated model that can always, almost always get zero classification uh, error on your training data. Right? But that doesn't mean it can generalize. Okay? It means it's captured all your training data well, but when you go to testing, you know, you're looking at new products, new faces, new words, new sentences. You need to be able to generalize, right? So we want to make sure that the models we capture that. And one way of doing that is with regularization, okay? So regularization is this, uh, well, one term that they stuck up here is uh, here, right, in the uh, lilac box. So what is this doing? Can anyone describe what, what this type of regularization is for and what it is doing? So, 
detection. So like, let's say uh, model detects um, like various systems um, which are not part of the part of the case, then what this system actually does is it synthesizes the, the model for fitting those particular systems, which will then give you a better um, better fit because the model doesn't overfit to those particular in um two particular relevant systems. Okay. So what, what type of regularization is this? Does anyone know? L2. Okay, what is it trying to do? Okay, so here are our parameter weights. All, right, all our theta are the parameter weights, right? And so what we want to do with this is add a penalty score, right? This is a loss function, right? So the higher this goes, the worse it is. Right? So we already have this part here, which is trying to say, let's make sure that our, our, our correct class is getting a good value and all the wrong classes are being suppressed. Okay? That's this part of the loss function. This part is basically saying, let, make, let us make sure all of these different thetas, okay, all the weights that we have, are close to zero. Okay? So uh, if possible, set them to zero so that they won't have an effect on the network. We want the values to be pretty small so that we don't get very wild classifications. Okay? So there's a lot to say about uh, L1, L2, all these norms and, and classification things, but uh, you can ask uh, people in the class, you can ask myself afterwards to understand what are the differences between all, all the different ways we regularize. Okay? So what this, what this does is it keeps your weights small, okay, uh, but, uh, and it will help you make sure that when you uh, go to testing, okay, so you can see the training curve here. This is the amount of parameters in your network, okay, so that's the model power, okay, how complicated your network architecture is, okay. Typically, the more parameters you get, the better you can fit the training data, right. Uh, I can show you an illustration of that if you'd like, okay? But uh, when we have too many parameters, you can capture the training data too well, and then uh, you'll start to have testing error, right? You'll have this uh, gap between your training error and your testing error won't reflect each other, and you have this uh, overfitting gap, okay? So when you see this in your training of your networks, as soon as you see, oh, something's wrong, my training error keeps on going down, my test error keeps on going up. One solution is to add regularization. Okay? Happens extremely commonly in neural network training. You almost always have to have some regularization parameter. Okay? Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, in normal machine learning architectures, uh, we're not dealing with NLP. We only have the capability to tune the model itself, okay? Which is uh, what he's going over in this slide. So uh, we're trying to distinguish the red from the green class. So uh, by adjusting the parameters, maybe we'll get another line here that gets this one wrong, but maybe gets uh, trades a position and gets these two right, okay? We can get a, a better boundary on this linear classifier, okay? But it's a little different with word vectors, okay, uh, we're going to see why in a minute, uh, because we are learning two different things at the same time. We're learning a model of the classification, okay, but sometimes we might also update our word vectors, okay. So we already heard from Ho Yang and others earlier that we can use word to vec to generate our word vectors, right? It's actually uh, a process that we create in a neural network. We use the neural network to output 300 dimensional representation of every word. Okay? That is a trained process. So it's also a machine learning process. But now when we are doing classification on top of that, let's say I want to be able to distinguish, I don't know, uh, names of companies versus other words. That's a classification in NLP class, right? Or I want to uh, assign a sentiment, right? Positive sentiment or negative sentence, sentiment to uh, a sentence, that's also a classification task, okay? So when I want to do these tasks, I have the opportunity to use my word vectors, but also to update their values, right? So for example, if I have a word vector representation for general words, 
how useful do you think it is for discriminating sentiment? Like whether things are positive or negative. Not particularly useful, right? So even if you have a, a meaning of a, a word like car, right? Truck. Oh, these two are related. How helpful is that to distinguish whether a sentence has positive or negative? Right? So we would say for words that carry sentiment, perhaps certain words can be used in such a way to reflect something else than their meaning. It, we could think about a, a sentiment-bearing vector for each word, right? And that can be tricky. For example, take the word large. That's an adjective. Does that have positive sentiment or negative sentiment? iPhone X 6.5 inch large screen. Positive or negative? Maybe positive, right? Large battery. Positive or negative? Right. So sometimes you can even see that a thing like large, which you say, oh, it doesn't have a sentiment. Of course it does. It just depends on the context, right? If you say large and heavy, positive or uh, negative sentiment? Probably negative, right? Okay. So even the same descriptor, large, can be have a positive or negative sentiment depending on context, right? So uh, sometimes we want to train our word vectors to better reflect that rather than use, choosing the general you know, words of a feta or um, words that congregate together mean the same, okay? So we, we, we may not be able to use that, okay? Okay, so this is a, a, a very useful slide from uh, Richard who said that um, when you retrain the word vectors, because basically in a neural network you can compose two neural networks together. You can compose the classification neural network and the neural network without the training of the word vectors, you stick them together and poof, you've got a, a single neural network. Okay? So you can do both things at the same time. But when you do that and you, what we call, retrain the neural network, you have to make sure you have sufficient data to retrain the neural network for the word vectors. Why is that? Let's take a look at this example, right? So in the training data, we have the word TV, we have the word telly, and in the testing set, we have the word television. Uh, when we go to the pre-trained word vectors, okay, that have been trained by somebody else, like for example, Stanford NLP groups trained the glove uh, word to vec, uh, sorry, the glove vectors, Google already trained all the word to vec vectors, they provided for all of you to use. Then all of these word vectors are in their vocabulary space because they've seen them all before. Okay? But let's say now you're doing some retraining of the the word vectors because you have your own data set. Your own data set has TV and tele, and your testing uh, data set has television. Okay? When you retrain the word vectors, what happens? Well, things are going to move around, right? Because you're retraining the word vectors, you don't expect them to stay in the same place, right? Fine. But what happens? Because your data set is small, okay? You don't have all of the tokens that word to vec has, right? Or glove has. So you might have some tokens like television that was in your training data, but not your testing data. So what happens? The training data of words are going to move because you retrain the word vectors, their positions have changed, right, to better capture the particularities of your corpus. But because you have some out of vocabulary items like television that only appear in your testing data set, and of course, being good machine learning people, you didn't train on your testing set, okay, then the word television stays where it is. It's out of vocabulary, it didn't get it's weights updated, and then you're messed up, right? This is bad, okay? So, as Richard already says here, you know, we want to retrain our word vectors by composing the classification task with our word vector generation task together as one network when we have sufficient data, right? Probably everyone in this room has taken some machine learning before. We know that when you get a small data set, we're likely to get large amounts of errors. It's true here, right? So if in doubt, if you don't have enough data, and that's most of us who are academics, you are in industry, 
Well, then you're probably quite rich with data. That's good for you. Um, then you probably don't want to retrain your word vectors. Okay? There, I don't think this is something that you want to talk about. Okay, we talked earlier about uh, positional information, right? So that uh, when we look at uh, a word vector, you typically train it with a word window with two things from the left, two things from the right. We put that in the classification for both the center word and all the other words, right? But in many cases, we want to preserve positional information. Um, uh, and how do we do that, right? If we want to build, let's say, a sentence representation from word vectors, right? Maybe one way we could do is just say, okay, I have n words in the sentence. I'm just going to take the vector for all of those single words, average them together, and then I have a representation for the sentence. Okay? That's fine. In fact, uh, for some tasks, that's sufficient enough. But sometimes it's not, right? If we need, for example, that uh, I'm forgetting your name. No, the one you had before. Dewey, yeah. Dewey said earlier that uh, what happens if we have uh, a knot, right? If I put a knot in front, I need to know what happened after the knot, right? I don't need to know. I, I need. I don't want to preserve the uh, incorrect information that's not as attached to another word. So I need positional information to accompany that. Okay? Let's see where we can find the part that I want to show. Okay, uh, there's a set of slides here that I've just glossed over a little bit that are talking about how to accomplish um, the, the implementation. So just make sure um, if you have access to a GPU, uh, which should be most of us, um, even if you don't have access, you can get one through Colab. You should be using um, the matrix multiplication libraries because this will uh, allow you to do all the computations in parallel versus using a for loop execution. So just make sure you're, you're clear about the advantages there. Okay, um, all right, let's hope we get to uh, this part. Okay, so um, if you have gone through neural networks and back topic before, uh, this should be a fairly easy part for you. I think there's, there's not a lot of complicated stuff here. Okay? So um, when you look at logistic regression, okay, it's basically the same as one neuron in a uh, neural network. Okay? Because what we're doing in a, a logistic classification is basically doing this computation, right? We have a, a signal, which is just, sorry, just the weights, right, times the observations, right, which is just um, a product, sum of products, okay? But we also have a bias term, which gives off our intercept, right? And we're going to push this signal through a logistic function, which is going to give us a probability value between the 1 and 0, so it's smooth, right? It's going to have this, this type of shape here. So I'm taking all the values between negative infinity and positive infinity and then squishing it between 1 and 0 to give us a probabilistic value. 
Okay, so how do we do that? It's uh, basically taking all the different dimensions uh, of my training vector. So for example, if I'm using a, a word vector, I would have 300 uh, or 50 dimensions here. Okay, taking all of those floating point values as input and assigning a weight, right? One component of the weight here. Um, taking the product and adding all of those together and then putting it through a non-linearity. That's our uh, logistic function and then outputting that value, okay? So output comes on the other side, right? So as it says here, um, the weights and the intercept, which is part of the weights, are just the parameters of that uh, logistic regression model, okay? So this is the standard logistic regression that you've taken in machine learning. Um, in fact, we're teaching it next week uh, for our machine learning class, okay? So when you go to a neural network, it's not much more complicated than that, right? It's just that you're going to compose a lot of these individual neurons together, and you're going to get out uh, a more complicated classification function, right? So uh, instead of feeding it to uh, x1, x2, x3, and the bias to just one uh, logistic regression neuron, you're going to pass it to several ones, okay? So we're going to get a vector of outputs, uh, but we don't know uh, ahead of time which variables these logistic regressions are trying to predict because we don't have anything that's tied to them yet. Okay, so uh, we can feed it to a multi-stage neural network by putting all of these logistic units uh, together in uh, different layers, and then put another layer on top of that, the final layer, to produce a particular classification that we want. So for example, maybe at the third layer, we're trying to output a, a classification value, right? Meaning, um, is it a named entity or is it not a named entity? Okay. And obviously, you can stack these layers on top. In fact, uh, a lot of good uh, research lately has come out of networks that are hundreds or thousands of layers deep, right? So you should know the notation for uh, a layer, right? So um, this just tells us which uh, weight we're talking about because in a neural network, you need to specify exactly which edge you're talking about, right? Each edge is basically a specific input being routed to a specific neuron, right? So all of these different uh, weights, all of these edges here represent a particular weight, a particular theta that we need to optimize. Right? So, okay, let's, let me pause for a second and ask you because I'm running out of voice. Um, who knows why we need to have a non-linearity? This is a, a basic concept in neural network. Okay. Right, so if you look at a single logistic neuron, it's a linear classifier. It cannot draw nothing but straight lines, right? The whole point of composing multiple levels of neural network is so that you can get things other than straight lines, right? Traditionally, in machine learning, you might have to go to a nonlinear mapping, like a, a kernel machine, like a non uh, SCM to do that. But with a neural network, you just do it by stacking layers together. So what Jinja said is, is absolutely correct, right? We use nonlinearity, which is basically, in this case, the sigmoid function, right? This function here, to be able to draw something else besides straight lines. But it doesn't have to be a complicated nonlinearity. It can be any type of nonlinearity so that we can uh, make sure that uh, we're getting uh, something different. Okay, so I think uh, also answered on Slack. Thanks very much. Okay. So uh, if we don't have that, just like Jin said, uh, when we're composing all of these uh, networks together, we're going to come out with uh, just another linear function. Okay. So uh, as uh, we said on uh, in class as well as in Slack, uh, having extra layers. Uh, won't be helpful because we can just compose them together otherwise, okay? So when we can do that, then we can get, um, when we have the nonlinearities, that means each level can uh, compose and represent more complicated functions, 
right? So we can get a, a classification that can capture a lot of irregularities in the network while still generalizing. Okay, so let's take a look at um, a specific event, uh, example of binary classification. So here we have a window. Museums in Paris are amazing. Okay, and so what I'm writing X here is to say I'm not using the actual word, I'm using the vector representation for each word. Okay, and say we want to know whether the center word, for example, Paris, is a location, right? So we've already talked about name identity recognition. Then um, we would say this is a false example, false, true, false, false, and we want to be able to call the ones that we called as true, namely the one in the middle here, as a, a location that has a, a name identity. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, again, we talked earlier about uh, balancing positive and negative examples. So here we have a, a positive example where Paris is a word that is a named entity. Okay, so we would look at the window around Paris. So museums in Paris are amazing. And then we can find a lot of negative examples of things that are not uh, named entities. So for example, museums is not a location. Uh, it's not a named entity because not all museums in Paris, then we would have this as a negative example. Okay. So here, um, as what uh, Richard is pointing out on this slide, um, there are plenty, usually in the identity recognition and a lot of natural language tasks, okay, uh, plenty of skewed distributions. You have a lot of negative examples, very few positive examples. So it becomes a very important part of training your algorithm to find good negative examples. What do we mean by a good negative example? Can you help me out with that? What would be a good negative example in this case? Martin? Okay, very good. So that's an example of a word, or rather part of a name, that represents a person rather than uh, a geographic location. Right? So we would want to choose hard cases like that where we expect the classifier to have a hard time distinguishing the positive from the negative class. Okay? So because there are so many negative examples to choose from, practically, because most of the sentences will have words that are not named entities, you have to be discriminative in picking the ones that you want to train your classifier on. You take, out, you take all of the examples without sampling, and you will end up with a classifier that does what? You'll call everything not a name entity because 99% of the data that is trained is all negative, right? So you might have spent, you know, I don't know, burnt $200 on your Amazon uh, uh, AWS account and you find out it does absolutely nothing, which is terrible, right? You don't want to do that. So you want to make sure that you sample <coughs> your negative examples appropriately um, so that you can get a, a good border between the positive and negative cases. So when we talk about a single layer a neural network, we saw examples of that just now. Okay, so we can think about something like this, all right, where we have a single layer, okay, and then outputting all of these to a, uh, another layer to uh, compose all of the outputs. Sorry, where did you go? Sorry. Okay, so. Um, well, actually, we've already done this already, right? We have all the Ws times the Xs, all of the inputs. We have our bias term, and we have a, a particular activation function. This is our nonlinearity to compute some output. So we've already gone through uh, using a softmax or using a, a logistic uh, curve to do that. So we can think about this type of feedforward computation. I have all of these vectors here. So these are vectors of size 4, for example, okay, um, for museum, for in, for Paris, for R, and amazing, these are our inputs. We're going to um, take their, the observation times it by our current 
set of parameters w. Uh, I don't know why he's using w for this. It's easy to understand this is theta. But anyways, you take them, multiply the uh, weights, okay? Then you will have the output, but you have to put that through the activation function, okay? So our nonlinearity. And then uh, you will have uh, your output here. So when we've already, Jin already said earlier that we add the extra layers so that we get some nonlinear interactions between the word vectors, okay? So that we can understand that only if museums is the first vector, then it should matter that in is in the second position, okay? So that we can take into account some ordering effects between um, the words. Okay? So, uh, earlier, I just said that it's important to pick uh, your negative examples appropriately, right? So um, that's the idea behind the max margin loss, is to make sure that we can easily discriminate between positive examples and negative examples. We want these scores to be as far away from each other, something like what you see in SVM training uh, about a margin. Okay, so we make the true window score larger and then take the negative examples of what he calls a corrupt window, make the scores lower for it until they're good enough. So we have this, um, this type of hinge loss here, uh, which is saying I want to separate these two as far away from each other. Okay? So uh, can anyone explain this formula to me? What, what is this formula doing? Have you guys seen this type of formula before? This is a type of hinge loss. How many of you have uh, done uh, SVMs before? Couple? This is a version of the hinge loss from, from SVM. Okay, sorry, it's, I should color it up a little bit. So this is a cost function, right? So what's our objective in a cost function is to minimize it, right? So what are we doing here? We have the max of two values, max of zero and, and some value, right? So what is, what's the hard part is this part here. So max zero, what, what, what do you think the zero term is for? Hmm? Yeah, so you want it to be zero when, when it's a negative value, right? Yeah. What is that thing? It's within some margin of classification. Okay? Either the, the classifier is getting it correct, so there's no loss, okay? Or it's getting a small enough loss that we're going to disregard it. Okay? Then what about the second half? 1 minus S plus SC. Did he describe what these uh, things are? Okay, yeah, okay. S is our correct window. SC is our corrupt window. Okay, so a positive example and a negative example. So we'll get to the fact that it's not smooth later. Right, a positive score and a negative score. We just want to keep the margin separating these two as large as possible to some unit value, so one. Okay, so that's the idea behind this. This is not a differentiable function, as you said, right? 
it is continuous because um, it looks like a, a hinge. So let's take a look at this. Let's see whether we can pull up the hinge function. All these plots are terrible. Let's see if we can find a better one. Okay. All not very good, but we'll use this one. Okay, so a hinge loss looks like this. It's the one in the green. Okay, basically it's saying within some tolerance between zero and one. Okay, um, I accept the value a as good enough. Okay, but as soon as uh, I go beyond that boundary, um, then I start to get some error. Okay, so let's let's try to explain ex explain it from this side. All right, so let's say I have a positive classification, and the output is also positive. Okay, then uh, we're gonna get a score that's uh, positive, and um, both things will line up well. So we're not going to have any cost. Okay, they're going to be the same value. If I end up anywhere along this line here, that means I have uh, start to either almost misclassify, that's this segment here, as well as misclassify it, that's this segment over here. Then I'm going to add a cost. Okay, so where does it come with a hinge loss? Is because I have this margin between 0 and 1. Okay, it means that uh, for this segment here, it means I still got the classification correct, but not with a large enough margin, not with a large enough boundary. Okay, so I, I think it's a named entity, but I'm not confident enough, then it would lie in this region. Okay, whereas I think it's not a named entity, okay, but it actually was, this is a misclassification. Okay. So on this black line you here you see one zero loss. Everyone should get that idea, right? One zero loss means either you got it right or wrong, right? Accuracy. If you said it was true and you said it uh, and it actually is true, there's zero loss. You said it was false and it was actually false, there's zero loss, right? When we have the converse of these two cases, right? Either it was true and you called it false or it vice versa, then we have a case where you misclassify it would have a one loss. Okay? So hinge loss represents this green line which says that you get the right classification all of these cases here between two and zero. Okay? But when I have a margin, this is our margin here up to uh, from zero to one, where I'm not so sure that the classification is correct, then I will start to incur some loss. Okay? Why do we do this? Because we want to, again, clearly separate out the positive and negative cases from each other. Okay? So even if you get the classification right, but you're not confident enough, or you're too close to the boundary, we're still going to declare it wrong for a fractional amount. Okay? And it has to be that um, the loss function has to be upper bounding the 0, 1 loss here. Otherwise, we don't have some theoretical guarantees. Okay? So I, I hope you have a, a better understanding of this loss function. It's, a, it's an important one. Okay? So when we do this type of uh, procedure, we're just trying to um, differentiate um, the positive examples from the negative examples using this loss function better. Okay? Um, so, uh, as you guys said on Slack, and uh, hopefully elsewhere, you notice that this function is not uh, smooth because it has a discontinuity right here, right at one, but it is piecewise differentiable, okay, which is the key. We want to be able to use stochastic gradient descent, any gradient descent methods on this. We can do that as long as the function is differentiable. We're not going to worry about these discontinuities right here. Okay, you're going to see this all the time in neural networks where we have a simple function like the ReLU, which allows you to do exactly the same thing. Okay? It's a just terribly simple function. Okay? 
So um, we're going to derive uh, the derivatives for this and then um, try to optimize the values. Okay. How do we do that? We use backpropagation. So backpropagation is a little hard to understand from these slides. Um, let me try to do it from another set of slides. It will be uh, a, a bit easier than this one. Okay. Let's go to uh, another set of slides. Okay, and I know it's already eight, so um, if you need to go, you're welcome to go, but I'll try to cover a little bit from uh, the other lecture of Stanford, which had pretty good slides for backprop. Sorry, wrong one. Give me one more minute. So yeah, if you didn't understand most of what I just said, you can also look like at Fei Fei Li's slides. Um, she describes the hinge function, I think, much more understandable than uh, Richard's slides. They're both from Stanford, so it, I don't think there's any problem. Um, and they have worked examples, so it, it figures out better. But I, I want to go over what she, her class did for um, for uh, gradient descent. Okay, so. Um, most of the time when we're doing uh, gradient descent, what we're doing is basically looking at this uh, very knotted net manifold uh, for the loss, our, our j function, right, our uh, cost function, and then trying to follow the slope down till we get a minimum uh, area, right? So we do that by taking the gradient of the loss function at any particular point where our current weight vectors are set taking the, the point-wise derivative of that, and then using that to take a step in the appropriate direction. So when you take the slope uh, in multivariate calculus, we just call that the gradient. So it's gradient descent because you're um, descending uh, against the gradient, okay? because the gradient is always pointing upwards. Okay? So you can think of it this way. If I have a, a current set of parameters, these are all our thetas, our current w's that we set, and I calculate the loss because the loss is just a function. It's going to give me a value, some positive value that I'm trying to minimize, right? Then I've, I take, uh, for example, I just uh, take the current W, okay, which is the same copy over here, and I just change the first dimension's value a tiny bit, okay? Then I'm going to compute the loss again. Oh, it changed, right? Okay? So I can uh, calculate how much gradient I got my difference in the weights with respect to the loss, right? So this is uh, just a simple computation by taking a small change, right? I just change my first value by a tiny bit, I get this different loss, and then I can find the gradient, right? And I don't have to do it just to that dimension, I can do it for all of the dimensions. Right? And then I will have computed the gradient. Right? So this is how you would do it analytically, right? Symbolically. But if you were going to do it um, through calculus, then uh, you can just take the derivative directly, right? So you can um, use uh, Newton's method and calculate the analytic gradient instead of the numeric gradient. Okay? So. Um, that's what we can do uh, if you uh, want to do the math, okay? So in practice, um, 
they tell you that we do both, okay? We write the software to do the numeric computation because computers are fast, right? Um, but we want to check it with our analytic understanding. So we will do the, the math, do the derivative of the loss function, and then check that actually what you have computed matches what you calculated. Because if you don't do both of these steps, one of them will be wrong, and then your training procedure will be screwed up. Okay? So it's important to do both steps. Okay? Don't try to write the analytic gradient as part of the software. Do the numeric part, okay? because it's much easier for the computer to, to compute that. But don't rely on your computation, you know, take, taking the analytic gradient and then writing it out into uh, a program because uh, making errors in your numeric gradient are very, 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 very hard to debug. Because you'll get out a value and you have no intuition whether that value is good or not. Okay? So, because you don't know any better, you think it's correct, you run your procedure and like it doesn't work and you're now lost. You don't know what happened, right? Was it your uh, computation of your gradient descent? or your model, or your parameters, all of these can go wrong, right? So when you write a, a gradient descent algorithm, you have to make sure that you check both things. Okay? So the basic uh, idea be behind gradient descent is just like this, right? You have some gradient that you evaluated, okay? And then you take a step in the direction of the negative of the gradient, and then you update your weights. You update your weights, okay? So uh, I think we all know what that looks like. It, it looks like uh, descending into a, a lower region by taking a step in that negative direction. Okay. And um, let's see what I wanted to show. Where is it? No. Okay, that part. Sorry, finally. Okay, we're gonna go through a simple example of back pop, and then we're finished. Yeah. So there are cases in which you might have problems calculating it, but uh, I think for the most part, we would decompose uh, a loss operation into its component parts. So we're, we're going to see that just now. Okay. So bear with me. So let, let's say we have a, a, a propagation example. I want to calculate this uh, function. Let's say this is our loss function. Okay. And I have uh, particularly uh, examples here of um, values. So, so x equals negative 2, 
y equals 5, z equals negative 4, right? And I'm trying to, um, and I'm decomposing a graph, right? So I have this x plus y times z. This is going to look like this computational graph here, right? So I have this z times x plus y. So this is my x plus y. This is my z times x plus y, right? So I'm going to do a, a forward pass first by uh, calculating the value. So negative 2 plus 5, when you add it together, it equals 3. That's my value here. For the addition, I'm going to call this node Q okay, in my computational graph. And then when I uh, take 3 times negative 4, it equals 12, right? That's my F. That's my output. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to propagate the gradient going back from the front part of the network to the back. That's why I call it back propagation, right? So I'm going to start with the gradient of the loss at the top. That's going to be 1 because, of course, the partial derivative of f with respect to itself is 1, okay? Then I'm going to try to get uh, my partial derivative of f with respect to my variable z, okay? So that's pretty simple, right? Uh, because I have this value here. I can just take the derivative and, and uh, pull it in, right? So everyone clear about why this is free? Because I have this negative 4 here, I have this negative 12 here. The gradient is 1. So I just um, go the inverse direction, right? And I'm going to get uh, my z equals 3 here, right? Okay? What about the, the partial derivative of f with respect to q? That must be the other way, right? Because our, our f function is simply um, just the multiplication of q times z. So that's going to be negative 4, right? And then when I want to get my partial derivative of f with respect to y, which is what I need for this part here, then uh, I can see what I'm applying here. I'm just applying the chain rule, right? Because I don't have it directly respect to f versus y, I have to go through the intermediate variable q, right? So I'm just going to chain these two together, right? I already got the partial with respect to this then I'm just getting the, the final one here, right? Okay. So addition is really simple. It's just x plus y. You take the derivative of, the, of that with respect to x, it's just 1, right? So I'm just going to take this uh, minus 4 and propagate it down here as minus 4. Okay? And the same over here, minus 4. And we're done for this. Okay? So if you think about it, what we're computing at every node in this graph is something like a, a local gradient, okay? And we're going to compose all of these local gradients together, like we saw here, to get the gradient at the, the source, right? We're starting from the end point and deriving it all the way back from this, uh, to the source. So back propagating through the network. So we have the gradients coming inwards from the previous part of the network, right? Then we compute the local gradient with respect to each of its uh, component variables here in X and a Y with respect to its output Z. And then we can compose it. So downstream from that, we're going to take all the things that happen up, upstream of this, upstream here. We're going to pass it all the way through and downstream. Okay, so here's another example. This is a one that you're probably more familiar with. This is a, a logistic loss, right? You saw this earlier, right? So what does this look like? This says uh, I'm going to compute the inverse of 1 plus e to the negative of all of these, uh, uh, you know, products of, uh, sum of products of uh, the weight vector times the inputs. So this looks like this, right? We have all the inputs. Right, here's our bias term, which is our W2. Here's our inputs, and I have times them, added them together, and then uh, taken uh, uh, multiplication of, uh, sorry, a negative exponent, and then plus one, and then inverse. Okay, so I can do the same thing. I'm going to do the forward pass first, right? So the forward pass says here, I have a current weight of two, negative three, and negative three for the bias. And I've observed a negative 1 and a negative 2 as my inputs, right? Then I'm just going to propagate these together. I'm going to do the multiplication, the addition, 
and then all the way to the end. So my final output is 0.73. Okay, then I have to work the other way back, right? So I'm going to start at the end of the network just like we did before. Okay, uh, the partial derivative of the function against itself is always 1, so we'll start there, right? And just like Martin said, we're going to take this complicated loss function and we're going to decompose it using this computational graph into its component parts, right? All of these component things. I'm just going to push the gradient all the way back to the front of the network, okay? Using all of these, uh, you know, standard calculus rules, right? So if I have a, um, a function that's an exponent, then uh, when you take the derivative of, the, of that, it's just the exponent, right? If I have an inverse, then it's going to be uh, one um, minus one x squared as uh, the derivative of the inverse, okay? So I can uh, use this to calculate that. That gives me the gradient for this part of the node. Same here, same here, same here, same here, okay? Because I had to do this computation with two parts because um, this goes to both of the splits, right? Because the addition will just push the the gradient in, uh, it's basically a gradient copy. I'll just push it to both parts of the gradient, right? Sorry. And same here. So all of these additions, you know, the one here, the one here, and the one here have the same copy of the gradient, right? And then we are going to do the times and the times, okay? So uh, you can use this idea to understand what backpropagation is, right? Backpropagation is basically the chain rule use the reverse, and because you can cache partial derivatives at any point in this graph, like say, if I cache the result here, I can use it for this part of the network as well as this part, um, it's quite efficient this way. Okay? So, um, this last uh, part that I'll go over, which is just to say there are certain patterns when you use backpropagation that you should remember. So, an add gate when you have a loss function that has an addition, you can think about it as a gradient distributor, right? You can see it right here, right? When we have a loss, uh, sorry, a partial derivative of two, when I put it through a plus, both of its component inputs also s receive the gr same gradient, right? A two and a two, right? What about a max gate? What does a max gate do? We have a lot of max computations, soft max, et cetera. What does that do? It's a gradient router. So you can see it here. When we have a max, okay, um, so upstream it was coming to a 2, and we're taking the maximum of uh, either variable z or w, okay. Variable z was a 2, variable w was a minus 2. So, of course, taking the max operator, what should be affected? Should be the maximum 1, right? So whatever is the, uh, the maximum value here is a 2, is going to receive the gradient, right? All of the other values, no matter what it is, so maybe this max value has 100 inputs, the only one that's going to receive the gradient is the one that has the maximum value. Okay, and you can think about it, it's a corollary to the min, right? You have a minimum operation here, only the, the, the single value that has the smallest number will receive a copy of the gradient. Everything else will be zeroed out. Okay? What about a multiplication gate? Right? It's a gradient switcher. You can take a look at that here, right? So you switch the sides of these gradients here. They both add up to negative uh, 24. So um, you can see how it's switched, right? So you're just getting a, a copy that's uh, inversely proportionate to the gradient. Okay? So gradients add at branches, uh, and uh, that's why we have to uh, deal with it like that. Okay, so when we go to a neural network, we're basically dealing with not a single uh, gradient with respect to a, a single variable. You have a whole uh, matrix or vector of vectors that you need to do the partial derivatives for. And uh, it ends up being a matrix instead of a, 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 sub, a single vector, right? So, um, yeah, it'll, it'll look like a, 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 a large matrix. 4,000 by 4,000, for example, in certain cases. Okay, so I think that's all we want to cover today. Um, please give us your feedback about whether this course is too slow or too fast. Okay, um, and we'll see you next week on Thursday. Yes, sir.
regarding to the work with the um, so I can understand the general idea and the project, but I'm not too clear about the exact project. Could you show us a similar example like this? How to generate the work with the vector? Okay. From the tools we have, the and how to generate the Okay, we can try to do that offline. So we'll let people go first. Okay, and then uh, if you want to stay around, we can try to cover that for a little while. Thank you, everyone. Sorry it took longer. Somebody left something there? Is that how I go